The sex scenes were written so awkwardly where the characters were literally using space terminology as they were doing it. They were saying shit like, this rocket ship is about to blast up. And I'm like, can I abort mission? It's only the first month of 2019 and I've already had a mental breakdown. But you know what's a good remedy when you're going through depression? Escapism through books. So for this video, I'm gonna talk about all the books I read in January. The first book that I read is Circe by Madeline Miller. This is a Greek mythological retelling of a villain in the Odyssey who we know as Circe. Rachel Marie asked me to be a guest on her live show where she would be discussing this book with a couple of other co-hosts. So I figured, okay, I need to actually read this shit. I overperformed by starting this book on January 1st and also finishing it on January 1st. So by the time I actually met up with Rachel and the other co-hosts to discuss the book, I barely remembered anything. But what I do remember is that I felt lukewarm about the book. Let me explain myself because I know that this is a universally loved book. Uh, it was hard for me to rate this book objectively because I'm someone who is not only unfamiliar with Greek mythology, I also don't care for it. I didn't care reading about it in school and frankly, I just have no interest in power hungry misogynistic people who have a god complex. I get enough of that in real life, honey, so not interested. But I gave this a try anyway because I hadn't seen a single bad review about it, so I I figured that I might still like it anyway, regardless of my feelings of the original source material. Objectively speaking, I'm sure that the book deserves four out of five stars. It has a lot of great quotes because the prose is beautiful. And from what I know of the source material, it seems that the author added a lot of depth to what we had always known to be a side character in the Odyssey. But I'm gonna go with my personal rating anyway and give it three stars because I figured this was a Goodreads Choice winner of the year. So many people have given it five stars. It really does not matter at all if some nobody like me <laughs> gave it an average rating. The main reason why I rated this book three stars is because I saw so many missed opportunities for it to be a better feminist story compared to all the hype that it was getting. I was really underwhelmed by how many unnecessary cameos of mortals and gods that appear throughout the book and I think it detracted from the character development that we were supposed to see for Cersei. None of these cameos contributed to her character growth and that's the thing. I feel like Cersei remained a side character for her own story and I assume the point of this book was to make her a fully formed character but instead we spend most of the time watching her chill on an island and just bang literally whoever comes to the island. To clarify, I don't mind that she chilled on the island the whole time because I I think that you can still be a strong character even if you're passive. I also don't mind that she was banging literally every guy that visited her island because I'm sure that you can make an argument that her reclaiming her sexuality is part of the feminist theme. But I argue that a woman being sexual and developing her powers is not enough to be a feminist story because almost all of the positive relationships she had throughout the book were with men. And among all of those positive relationships with men, she banged all of them. And I know that the author was trying to stay faithful with the source material. And from what I understand, it seemed like Cersei had always been casted as a side character where her island is a station for all these to just visit and be like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. So now we're finally getting her perspective while they were whamming and bamming. But I don't think this added to her character growth. I think they were unnecessary and I think that you can still stay true to the source material while focusing on different parts that would have made the story a lot better. We could have explored the complex relationships she had with her sister and her brother. We could have seen her reconcile with the woman that she turned into a sea monster. And we could have seen something really revolutionary with all of the nymphs that had been banished to her island. Imagine a concept where there's an island full of women who have been exiled by the other gods because they did not follow the rules of their toxic culture. This would have been an amazing way to subvert the misogyny that we're so used to seeing in Greek mythology by seeing powerful women who didn't fall into line with that kind of culture. I'm just saying we could have had it all, but we didn't. I just think it's a shame because the beginning of the book did a really good job of setting up the family dynamics and showing how abusive Greek gods were and how Circe is defining herself outside of the box that we've been taught as power. And I really wish it would have stayed on that track. But instead, we have a bunch of dudes that we gotta bang because sexuality is like the only thing to portray in feminism, I guess. But what do I know? I know it sounds like I'm being a prude by complaining about this. So to balance it out, I will admit that I actually did like the last guy that Cersei ended up with. Wink, wink. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Wink, wink. If you've read the book, you're also probably judging me right now for saying that. We all know that last relationship was fucking weird. But you know what? 
I'm kind of into it anyway. So I guess the moral of the story is I'm very picky when it comes to feminist books and I'm also trash. Moving on, the next book that I read is Ruin and Rising by Leigh Bardugo. This is the third and final book of the Grisha trilogy, which is a popular YA fantasy book that has an average rating of four stars on Goodreads for some fucking reason. I don't know why I've been rating it as two stars. I actually started this book in December, but I didn't finish it until January, which is a shame because I really didn't want to bring it over to my 2019. But you know, I just, I, I couldn't bring myself to finish it in time. And now I think the title really defines my year so far. I only read this series because I was invited to be a co-host on Cat's show for the Carisha Longathon. I thought it would be fun, but I ended up hating this series anyway. So I guess the other moral of the story is that I should just stop showing up to live shows. So the majority of this book, we are forced to follow this ragtag team of misfits and if I could care about them any less, I would literally be dead right now. This is the same shit I've been saying for all of these books so far. The main characters were bland, the side characters were barely developed so they felt one-dimensional, and the villain was very, very one-dimensional. The only thing that surprised me about this book was that I actually liked the ending. Well, like is a strong word. Maybe I just liked that I was done with it, but regardless, a lot of people had told me that I would hate the ending, but I was surprised to find that I actually didn't mind it. I thought it made a lot of sense for the characters, and if I actually cared about the characters, I would have been content with the outcomes that they had. So yeah, surprisingly, I was pretty satisfied with the outcome, but regardless, Alina does not deserve a fucking Netflix show. How dare you take away screen time from Six of Crows? My only hope is that Netflix will make the story better. And they've got a lot of fucking work to do, but you know what? I think it's possible. I want to believe. I also want to grieve for the time that I've lost reading this series. After that, I was so burnt out from fantasy and YA that I switched over to reading literary books for the rest of the month. So the book that I picked up next was The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Cowell. This is an alternate history novel that takes place in the 1950s where a meteorite has hit the earth and created climate change that's so bad that now we have to figure out how to colonize space. Alternate history, more like actual future because <laughs> we're fucked. I picked up this book because Jesse from Bowties and Books had tweeted tweeted about it, raving about how amazing it was. They didn't even bother explaining what the book was about because they were saying that the book is just that good and you need to read it anyway. So I was like, all right, that's a pretty compelling argument. I definitely see why Jesse loved the book so much because the main character is a WASP pilot and a mathematician. And the book is about her fighting for her right to become an astronaut along with all the other women pilots who are perfectly qualified to join the NASA program but have to deal with all kinds of barriers to even be accepted because men are the worst. It's a very empowering story for women, especially women in the STEM field. It even feels like a biography sometimes because the events that happen in the plot and the characters all feel so real. If you love hidden figures, if you love books with diverse women, I would recommend this book for you. Personally, I was really impressed by two things. The first was the extent of research that was put into aerospace and all of the historical details that were put throughout the story. I legit thought that this author must have been an astronaut, but whenever I turned to the back of the book, I would see that she is like a puppeteer. And I'm like, what the fuck? She did so much research that it honestly felt so real. All the characters knew what the fuck they were talking about. I was very impressed by that. She also extends the same thought and care into representation of all the characters and what it was like to be discriminated based on your gender, your race, and even your mental health. The main character is a Jewish woman who is struggling to be accepted into the space program, but it is noted several times throughout the story that her experiences are a lot easier compared to black people pilots and Latina pilots and Asian pilots. And I was just really surprised by the intersectionality of it all. I think the main character has a really good balance of being a very real, intelligent human being, but at the same time, someone who is coming to terms with their privilege and making mistakes, but learning from it still, which is what makes her a very real human being. I think people who tend to be anti-social justice might view this as too pandering to the point where it's distracting, but trust me, as a woman of color, working in an industry that's predominated by white men, this shit is accurate. None of this shit is exaggerated or overdone. The gender and racial dynamics that were highlighted throughout the story are very real, and I can testify to this shit, so don't fucking try me. Because of all of these things, I rated the book four stars. I did not rate it five stars because I found the writing style to be pretty basic, and a lot of times it gets pretty cheesy, especially with the sex scenes, which were completely unnecessary. I know that I look like a prude for complaining about this once again, but 
but this shit is different. The sex scenes were written so awkwardly where the characters were literally using space terminology as they were doing it. They were saying shit like, this rocket ship is about to blast up. And I'm like, can I abort mission? But when I talked about this with Jesse, they actually liked the sex scenes. They found it so appropriately nerdy and endearing for the main characters. So I guess different strokes for different folks, literally. This is why my videos don't get sponsorships. I also felt like I was never at the edge of my seat at any point. I didn't feel like the plot got tense enough for me to really be immersed into the story, but Jesse felt differently. They felt tension and nervousness throughout the story. So again, I just think it's a matter of different perspectives. I think what would have really pushed me to rating this book five stars is if the book had focused on showing the perspectives of the entire cast of female pilots instead of just focusing on the main character. And that's not to knock down on the main character because I think she is a good character to read. I think she would be a great role model for girls to read about. But there's a lot of potential to read about the different struggles that the other women have faced in order to really enhance the themes of intersectionality that the authors strive to have. So having multiple perspectives for this story, I think would have taken it to a whole new level. If we had gotten that, my rocket ship would have blasted off, if you know what I mean. Okay, moving on. The next book that I read is one that I do not have with me right now, but it was The Handmaid's Tale. Because after reading a book about women being oppressed, I just figured, why not go all the way? The Handmaid's Tale is a dystopian novel where the US government has been destroyed and society has regressed into a more old school way of viewing things where women are much more subservient to men and pretty much used as breeders to compensate for the declining birth rates. They become handmaids who literally get fucked by men so that they can bear children for their wife. So if your ovaries are good to go, then you're a handmaid, baby. Blessed be the fruit indeed. You know what? I'm kind of glad that I read this book because I was having a tough time at work where I wasn't really looking forward to going there. But reading this book made me think, man, you know, at least I have a job. At least I'm metaphorically fucked over by men in power instead of physically. Blessed be my fruit. I usually don't read classics because school has turned me off from them, but I wanted to give this a try anyway because I tried out the first 15 minutes of this show on Hulu and then I had to stop because I was like, this shit is so fucking weird that I need to read the book. So I did and I have very mixed feelings about it. I had a really hard time figuring out how I should rate this book because on one hand, I was super into reading the story. I was really Really excited to read it every time I picked up the book because this shit was so weird that I wanted to find out why it was happening, how the society end up this way, and just put together all of the context clues and flashbacks and figure it out. I also thought the writing style was very immersive and moody, so you could really get into the universe where life feels so dull and monotonous and pointless. Hashtag relatable. But the ending left me so dissatisfied that I was like, fuck, what do I rate this book now? It had such an incomplete ending that I was like, blessed be the fruit. The fruit must have been blueberries because now I have blue balls. Like I said before, the reason why I enjoyed reading this book is because I was so excited to find out how the society was formed. But the world building was very incomplete and it had a very ambiguous ending to the point where I think it left too much to the imagination. I'm thinking this shit doesn't even feel realistic because how can there be such a dramatic cultural change in such a short amount of time in one of the most liberal countries in the world? I mean, I know that this country is going through some pretty strange shit right now, but still. If it provided some more answers, I think this would have made the story a lot more believable. Otherwise, it feels kind of exaggerated and hokey, and in my opinion, the best kinds of dystopian novels are the ones that are more nuanced when showing their themes. I also wish we got to see more character development, more relationship building, more plot structure, just more of anything other than atmospheric writing. But I know that wasn't the point of the book and it's supposed to feel very monotonous and unchanging, which is why it's it's very hard for me to rate this book. So for now, I'm gonna rate it four stars because first of all, I need to increase my average rating on Goodreads because it is abysmally low. But second of all, I'm trying to view this within the context of the time that it was written and comparing it to other books in its genre. And I think when I do that, I do see how it stands out among others. And I did genuinely enjoy my experience reading this book throughout until I got to the ending. That being said, I think if the book was published today and I compared it to other books within this time period and this genre, I would have rated it 
three stars. So that's my convoluted thinking. Basically, take my ratings with a grain of salt because even I don't know what the fuck I'm thinking. Speaking of women not being allowed to read or write, the next book that I read is Educated by Tara Westover. This is a memoir about Tara's experience growing up in the mountains with a survivalist family who forbade the kids to go to the hospital or to school because they thought that it was government propaganda and their kids would be brainwashed by Illuminati bullshit or something like that. I don't know, the family's fucking crazy. The author ended up having to teach herself math and grammar so that she could take the exams and be accepted into college and then she eventually ended up in Cambridge and Harvard. I picked this book up because it got a lot of buzz and it was selected as Goodreads book of the year in 2018 so I figured that it must be good. Also the synopsis sounded crazy as fuck so I was very curious to give it a try and you know what? It fucking deserves the five stars that it got from me because that shit was so good. I thought it was so good, so interesting, so engaging. It's not even the fact that this book has so much fucked up shit happening because it definitely does. Like the author's story is basically a roller coaster of traumatic events. And I think it would have been very easy to turn this into a thriller novel where you're just a horrified observer. I can see the entertainment value in that, but I think what made this book stick to me on a personal level was that thematically, the story was about self-invention, where someone grew up in such horrible circumstances and fought to break out of it and form her own identity outside of what she was taught. As someone who is also estranged from my own family, I used my education and now my career to move out of my hometown, move away from my family, and just build my own life for myself. So I felt a lot of sympathy for the author, and I was really engaged in her story of transformation because I could relate to it. I would definitely recommend this book to anybody who comes from a dysfunctional family because I think it stands as proof that you don't have to be trapped by your circumstances and you can define your own life for yourself. I also love the poignant way that she reflected on her life and the way that she crafted her words together because you can tell that they were very carefully chosen out and that she is a very deeply reflective and thoughtful person. I think it would have been really easy to show her family as caricatures, especially when you've been a victim of their horrible behavior. But Tara showed different sides to her family in a way that made them feel like real humans. I mean, they're awful humans, but they're humans nonetheless. And she shows a combination of horrible moments and horrible treatments that they've had, but also showcases a lot of tender moments that she's been through as well. And I think painting that kind of full picture makes it make a lot more sense why it was so hard for her to let go. If you read the book, you might remember that there's a scene where she and her parents visit Niagara Falls. When I was reading that scene, I had to put the book down because it reminded me so much of my sister that I just had to take a moment and be like, holy shit. Because my sister regularly interacts with her parents and visits them very often and even goes on vacations with them. And I didn't understand why she still stays in contact with them even after the things that they've done to her. But when I was reading the scene where Tara and her parents went to Niagara Falls and shared this really tender moment together, it was like I was seeing hit through my sister's eyes. So yes, five stars to this memoir. I thought it was very engaging, very well written, and very personal to me. So it was a very easy rating for me to give. A common criticism that I've seen for this book is that a lot of people are questioning how much of the story is embellished. And at first I was kind of offended to read these criticisms because I think it kind of veers towards gaslighting and generally not believing victims of abuse. But it is true that all memoirs are embellished. And I think it's fair to have healthy skepticism for that. But I would argue that this memoir is as reliable as it possibly could be. Because throughout the book, Tara includes footnotes where she clarifies that her memory might not be as accurate and she provides different accounts based on what her other siblings have shared with her. So she points out her perspective and the contradictions that other families have expressed. And I think the fact that she went out of her way to include those footnotes and try to be as fair as possible shows that she's aware that our memories can be subjective and that she's trying to tell the story as accurately as she possibly can while remaining true to her own experiences and her own feelings. And at the end of the day, if someone is bearing their whole life story to you, I think that's all you can really ask them. And I think regardless of the details or the minutia of things, I 
percent believe that her trauma is completely real and valid and the way that she has approached her memoir reassures me in that validity so solid five stars for me i don't give a fuck we're gonna stand together in solidarity and then the last book that i read is the happiness project by gretchen rubin this is a non-fiction book about the author spending a year focusing on different methods to become happier she focuses on various aspects of her life like minimalism family work passion projects etc all of those things that would make you have a more well-rounded life i picked this book up because your girl is depressed and she needs all the help she can get this was pretty good timing when i started this book because i picked it up when i was having a very shitty week and a very challenging time for my mental health so did it help me no it did not so the author says that everyone's happiness project will be different which i agree with but i question how much value her book actually brings when the demographic seems to be very limited to wealthy white women when i was reading this book it started to feel like this was less of a self-help book and more like reading a bored mommy blogger who decided to do like a bunch of cute little experiments to spice up her life and then halfway through the book she actually did end up making a blog where she recorded her project how do I know these things? It's worth noting that she is neurotypical, which means that she does not deal with depression or any other mental health issues that have compelled her to take medication for it. It's also worth noting that she and her husband are very wealthy and live in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I'm not knocking her down for that. Frankly, I wish I could be like that. I think the things that she tried out certainly wouldn't hurt to try out, even if you do have depression, because it's always good to exercise and think positively and all that kind of crap. You should do that. I need to do that. Whether you're happy or unhappy, you should still do all of those things to improve your life. Regardless, I rated this book two stars anyway because I think that the purpose of this book is meant to teach and to inspire, and I didn't feel like it did either of those things very well. I don't think it teaches you anything new that you should already know by now, and I personally didn't find it inspiring because I think the demographic is very limited to a subset of women that I don't relate to. I'm not a suburban mom, I'm not a rich wife living in New York City, and and I could tell that this book was not for me because one of the things that she said that made her happier was learning not to nag her husband all the time. And instead of asking him to do things, she learned to just do it herself. And I'm like, okay, wow, was this book published in the 80s? Nope, early 2000s. Great. She also did this weird thing where she would pat herself on the back whenever she would not feel resentful of other people for not showing appreciation to her whenever she did acts of kindness to them, which were unsolicited, by the way. For example, she decided to plan her mother-in-law's birthday party, which she volunteered to do so. And she kept on commending herself for not feeling resentful for having to plan this. And I'm like, bitch, you were the one who volunteered to do it in the first place. Then on the day of the party, her mother-in-law and everybody was having good time, everybody was happy, but she was moping around because she felt like her organizational skills were not being recognized by other people. And then later, when it was time to give gifts to the mother-in-law, in the middle of it, the author's husband stopped to give the author her own gift. So this dude gave the author a gift at his own mom's party. And then the author cheered up instantly, and now everybody was having a good time. Bitch, what? And once again, like she says, everyone's happiness project is different. I'm glad that she's working on her weird passive aggressive tendencies, but maybe if you wanna market your book more accurately, you shouldn't say that this is your journey to become happier. You should say that this is your journey to become less entitled. But what do I know? I'm just a depressed girl on the internet. I'm glad that this project worked out for her and I think that there's some merit in seeing how other people do things to make themselves happier that you can learn and take from, but I just don't see how her story is anything special. Am I mean for saying that? That's probably why I'm depressed because I'm a bitter bitch. Anyway, those are all the books I read in January. For the month of February, I will be participating in Blackathon. So I will be reading Pride, An Unkindness of Ghost, Not That Bad, Helium, Bingo Love, and whatever else I can squeeze into the month. I'm very excited to read all of these books by Black authors because they've been on my TBR for a long time. And now I finally have an excuse to read them right away. So yeah, maybe next month I will be less of a racist. So look forward to that don't forget to unsubscribe and thanks for watching bye who am i someone that's afraid to let go uh, you decide if you're ever gonna let me know yeah suicide if you ever try to let me go i'm sad i know yeah i'm sad i know yeah who am i someone that's afraid